Good evening, everyone. Wow, we have uh, excellent turnout, full house. Just welcoming everyone, we'll begin shortly. Uh, those were the very, very uplifting melodic sounds of Miss Stephanie Wolford, uh, who you will hear, Woodford, excuse me, you will hear more of um, who does uh, the music for these events. And we'll tell you more about that. Uh, tonight's event is hosted by Dr. Veronica Honeycutt, which I'll introduce soon. Um, we'll wait just a few more minutes for folks in the waiting room but I just wanted to welcome you. Thank you. What do you think, Dr. Honeycutt? One more minute. One more. Mary, minute. do we have do we have more people in the waiting room? Has everyone been let in already? No. I think for everyone, everyone has been let in. Yes, everyone's been let in so far. What do you think, Mr. Fong? Dr. Joe, should we get going? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. This is great. Um, I want to welcome everyone. I'm I'm Thor Keslovsky, and I um, play sort of a, a background host here, helping Dr. Honeycutt with this workshop. And this is a series of workshops that Dr. Honeycutt and Honeycutt Foundation have been sponsoring on very, very important issues on race. Sort of critical, critical conversations we all need to have. And um, Dr. Honeycutt uh, or Mary, could you please uh, put up Stephanie's information? I think um, Dr. Honeycutt is gonna talk about that a little bit. I want to just give the, the audience, though, some, some information about um, how we're going to conduct this. Um, if you could all keep your, um, your Zoom on mute um, and during so, so that the speakers can, you can hear the speakers. And during the, the workshop, you're going to, it's going to trigger sort of questions and ideas and potentially just comments from you. We want you to put those, those questions or statements into the chat. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect all the questions at the end and uh, Dr. Canton and Baird Fong are gonna engage in a conversation. And at the end of that conversation, we're gonna have time for a Q and A from the audience. And because we have so many people, we can't do it live. We have to put it into the chat. So at the end of their discussion, uh, Ms. Mary is going to be reading off the questions and we're gonna have Baird and Dr. Canton answer them. And then we'll close out with some remarks on uh, Dr. Honeycutt. And so with that, I want to introduce uh, the very, 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 I've got a couple more berries in there, very, very fabulous Dr. Veronica Honeycutt. The author, if you don't know her, the author of the hottest book on the internet, 
straight talk, which is giving guidance to young folks out here so they can live a very, very fruitful life. Uh, and she'll tell you more about her book. But uh, Dr. Honeycutt, why don't you um, come on in and take it away? Thank you so much, Thor. It is uh, wonderful to be here. Good evening, everyone. And, and thank you for joining us uh, at this event. This is our seventh racism and white supremacy virtual presentation. Uh, this is our last presentation for 2021. Uh, and and it, I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator and our guest speaker. Our moderator is Dr. Joe Canton. Uh, he is a professional facilitator and public speaker. He is known for speaking on questions of racism and other topics. He's a consultant, an educator, the president and CEO of Canton Associates. He has a master's degree from Occidental College in Urban Studies and a PhD from UC Irvine. He is also a former Coro Fellow. And it is an honor for me to introduce our outstanding guest speaker, Mr. Bayard Peter Fong. Uh, Bayard and I go a long ways back. Uh, we did some volunteering for an activity uh, in 1979 or, and 80, and that's when I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Fong. Mr. Fong is a native San Franciscan. He's a Bernal Heights homeowner, has three grown children, attended City College of San Francisco and other institutions, including UC Berkeley, from which he graduated with a BA degree in psychology. Now, he earned a master's degree in contract compliance administration at Morgan State <laughs> University. Mr. Fong has worked at the Chinese for Affirmative Action, uh, the US Department of Labor, and the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. He has volunteered with many organizations, including Friends of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission, the Coalition for Economic Equity, the Red Cross of San Francisco, the MLK Birthday and Community Breakfast, Chinese American Democratic Club of which, and by the way, he is currently the president. And he has dealt with the issues of discrimination and promoted equity and inclusion throughout his lifetime and his work. He's presently exploring ways to stop Asian PI hate and violence faced by those communities who have dealt with prejudice and systemic racism since coming to America in the 1850s. So it is indeed my pleasure to turn the program back over to Dr. Joe Canton. And I'm so delighted that we have him and Mr. Fong to uh, engage in our discussion on racism and violence against Asian Americans. Dr. Canton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Honeycutt. I'd like to say to the audience, welcome. Uh, this is a great program that's been sponsored by Dr. Honeycutt and HGE. And it's important, it's an issue today that we hear so much about, but it's a prevailing issue that's been around for 400 years. And of course, I, it seemed like I've been talking about this issue much longer. But our goals tonight essentially is to speak to your action notions where you are to think about what it is that you can do as an individual in solving this problem. This is a national problem. It's a local problem. And it's, it's been around a long time. So the goal is to deal with how you feel about Asian Americans as allies at this in this fight. And when it comes to standing up against violence, shouldn't we all come together and join in that struggle? And of course, we know through the history, there are people of many uh, ethnic backgrounds who join in this struggle already. What can you do to fight violence and racism against Asian Americans? As you know, that's made the headlines here in San Francisco and around the country. And you'll see some information that I'll share later, but our goals is to talk about 
What can you do to fight violence and racism against Asian Americans? Then the other question is why is racism at the heart of America's inaction as it relates to violence against Asians? Why it seems that there, there seem to be uh, a low interest in terms of only when there's a significant, significant incident. Now, what types of racism do you see as it relates to violence against Asians? Because you hear me for, to talk about, uh, there's no different flavors. Racism is racism, but if you, you might have vanilla, you might have chocolate, but it's still racism. And the question is, how, another question is, how can we be the drivers of change in the violence against Asian Americans? And I know you are as much uh, incensed over the news when you see these violent incidents occur in our streets against the, the Asian community and the elderly as well, it's especially you see those violent incidents. So those are our goals. They're over, over, these are the overarching goals that we're seeking uh, to get across to tonight. And we'll move on. And as I develop the foundation for our discussion, Mary, you might want to move that. As we develop this foundation for our discussion tonight, uh, share some statistics in relationship to Asian Americans. We found in the 2000 United States Census that defines Asian Americans to include persons having origin in any of the original people of the Far East, Southeast Asia, or Indian subcontinent. Now, many folks in our audience and in the community really don't know who is an Asian American, who is an Asian. Uh, we'll get into that discussion to talk about the different ethnic groups within the Asian community. Uh, there are 20 million Asians living in America and it's the fastest growing racial minority of ethnic groups in the United States. California has the largest population of Asians, approximately 5.2 million. New York with the second largest, 1.6 million. And I emphasize again, many Americans do not know the difference among the groups, nor are they capable of speaking the various languages spoken by these groups. So here we, we start with, with a very important issue of identity. Who are we talking about when we talk about Asian and Asian Americans? Now, hate crimes, we, we hear a lot of talk about hate crimes. I find it interesting how uh, this notion of hate crimes somehow is different than uh, hate crimes seem to be different than, than racial incidents. And I find it kind of interesting in terms of the reporting. Uh, personally, I see no difference. I see hate crime as a part of racism. Uh, there have been a 107% increase of hate crimes. That in a jump, there's a significant jump in California. Now, remember, California is the most ethnically structured uh, uh, state in the union. And report this is a report by the California Attorney General Rob Bonto, where he talks about 31% of these hate crimes are reported to law enforcement, which means that there's a significant number of those hate crimes are not reported. You find also hate crimes against African-Americans would increase by 88% here in California and hate crimes against Latino communities increased by 38%. Now these statistics of certainly you can say how reliable it is and, and you might say is, are, are these understated? In many instances, you, you, you would certainly think they may be understated because a lot of these hate crimes go unreported. The victim do not report the crime or the crime is, uh, is not actually investigated and, and a resolution is made. So this increase, this spike makes the newspaper. So here we are as we talk about uh, this increase in hate crimes. Next. Now the California Attorney General's report backs up some of the studies that found a hate crime rising both in California and across the country. Now, some of you understand the political climate that we, we're in right now and how 
we find the flames of this hatred is incited by national leaders, some of our national leaders who take the podium to deal and speak and incinerate these crimes and embolden those groups who perpetrate those crimes uh, in the United States. Uh, we find a, a rise across the country in recent years uh, with the pop polarization where we are polarized. Uh, in the, the, we have more emboldened hate groups and, and in the stress in the global health crisis, we are including inflammatory racist rhetoric from major national leaders. Now, this language you might say is harmless, but it's not because we can see it's a serious matter. And matter of fact, this program or these program uh, presents the seriousness of racism and white supremacy and the threat that it, it, it places in our community and our nation as a whole. Matter of fact, it's threatening the, the, the seed of our democracy right now, how, dem how we are viewed in the world. Uh, racial hatred is, is, is a serious problem. And silence is no longer an answer. You cannot take the position where you see no evil, speak no evil, and hear no evil. Uh, you must speak out and take action against this virulent danger that we face. And this is why these programs that Dr. Honeycutt has brought forth uh, is very important to our national community as well as our local community. And we're happy to bring be here tonight with a, with a freedom fighter who has who have served in a number of capacities uh, in fighting these crimes in our community and also trying to build a better community by bringing us together, understanding that the fight is not divided, but the fight is a unified fight that we must all work to solve these problems together. And the Honorable uh, Banner Fong, by the way, I call him Honorable because he served uh, in the community as a soldier, dealing with racism on the Human Rights Commission here in, in San Francisco. He's worked dealing with affirmative action in the Asian community. And he is a leader who is worthy to be talked about. And he's going to share with us tonight uh, out of his experience to help us get greater insight as to what it is that we can do, individuals, organizations, and how we must mobilize to take this struggle to the next level. And, and that level is to, to achieve full justice here in America, San Francisco, and in the world. As you know, racism, white supremacy is a global problem. It's not just a local problem, but it's a national and a global problem. It's a problem that the world must solve. No one has solved it. It's been around, uh, I know, in America for 400 years. Now, somebody said, well, gee, you're still talking about that problem, racism, white supremacy, 400 years. Well, if you check out the history and connect the dots, you find that folks have come along that path. A lot of lives have been lost in the struggle of dealing with this problem. So the Honorable Mr. Fong will speak with us this afternoon. And as I engage him in this conversation, it is a conversation. Matter of fact, we call it straight talk. Straight talk, because this is a subject nobody wants to be straight about. <laughs> they, they tend to want to, uh, it, it becomes inciting, it, it becomes uh, controversial. It becomes, but here tonight, you're going to find straight talk. We're going to be talking about this from a real perspective. And as a result of that, we brought uh, Mr. Fong in to enlighten us and to provoke us and, and ev evoke us into taking action as he has done over the years as a soldier in this struggle. So, Mr. Fong, I'm here now as I engage you in this conversation. Would you share with us uh, the, the, the challenges that you have been working with in, the very, in, in your work? But give, give, give our people out there uh, a taste of your background in terms of uh, who you are and what you've been doing and, and, uh, and just share with us in an informal way right now uh, in, in terms of, of who you are and what you represent. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Canton and uh, Dr. Veronica Honeycutt. Uh, you know, we got to get, 
worked together on the 1980 census uh, way back when we were trying to make sure we got a good count for San Francisco of every one of us here in San Francisco, especially our various diversities of all people, including um, immigrant uh, communities as well. Um, actually, I'm born and raised here. Uh, my great grandpa came in 1905. He uh, came over on a labor contract to be a cook for a family that lived in Pacific Heights. And, um, but you know, America was very tough. Uh, you, you couldn't bring your wives or your kids over. You could just come over by yourself. There's a lot of discrimination that was faced back in those days. Um, actually, I've learned recently in the past year that my grandfather's wife, actually his father, was a railroad worker back in the 1860s. So, um, and you know, the railroad workers also were brought in by um, the big four who were uh, Stanford and uh, the bunch to try to this, this western side of the Transcontinental Railroad and the Chinese um, laborers, 10,000 and then up to 14,000 were actually from the Pearl River region in China and uh, great-grandpa are from, and my dad as well, uh, that connected America from left to right, Pacific to the, to the, and last four years, I learned that besides building that railroad, they built the railroads for all the other, they were good workers and they were willing to work hard. And then they also built the Transcontinental Railroad for Canada and Mexico. I just didn't know. Yosemite National Park, they built the park and it built the roads there and it blasted the tunnels there. I thought that Yosemite rich folks that could go to, because we could never afford to go there. Our forefathers helped build it. And so the pride has been, it wasn't been around all these years. And now today, my latter part of after retiring, now I can take and feel as Mr. Fong, we didn't have opportunity to feel full. In a, Mr. Fong, I apologize yes. for interrupting yes. you, but uh, okay. you appear to be freezing a bit. Someone from the audience suggested maybe turn off your camera, although we'd like to see your lovely face. Perhaps turn off your camera <laughs> for a minute and it'll improve the quality of your uh, the sound, okay? Why don't you give that a try? Um, anyway, so I wanted to just continue a bit. Um, and so, you know, it, it was, it was a tough time, but, you know, they're getting back to great grandpa. And so he's, he's, he, he, he lived in San Francisco at age 28 in an SRO hotel. Meantime, six days a week, he was living in, in somebody's home, living there and working there. And the only day he got off was Sunday and we could go down to the, his SRO room where there was four, four bunk beds and, and confer with his friends and family. But basically the wives and, and kids were not allowed to be there. So it was a, a tough individual life style back in the day. And then when grandpa came over in 1906, uh, at the age of 16 in um, uh, 2000, uh, I mean, excuse me, 1920, uh, Oh gosh, 1923, I guess it was, because he was born in 1906. Uh, he did go to St. Mary's and, and Catholic school in Chinatown and got a good warm support, warm support from the Catholic community and the church there that helped bring up a lot of our community here in San Francisco, including our family. Because not only did my grandpa go, my dad went there and then we went there. And uh, so uh, it, was, it was a good base for, for my experience. Uh, the other interesting part of my history includes, uh, well, when I was growing up, uh, I actually, uh, our family needed a little bit of help from foster care, so I got to benefit, we, our family benefited from support from uh, the Beatty family, and so my younger sister and I were with the Beatty family for a few years. The, the American life, the American the American custom style. That was an interesting experience from age four to seven. And then later on um, uh, at seven, um, uh, I'm uh, Vanna, Mommy Vanna, we called her, 
asked us to go to move to grandparents from where my big sister was. So we moved to grandparents and we got immersed into the Chinese Americans uh, world of the different the foods, different kinds of customs. And uh, they ran a laundromat on the corner of California and Divisadero. My grandpa ran a laundromat and um, he was serving Western Edition and Pacific Heights. So half of his customers were black community members and half were white from Pacific Heights. Uh, but my grandpa taught me something. He says, okay, so when you help these customers out to get their laundry and give them the change, you make sure you treat them right and you make sure that they're a happy customer that they wanna come back next time. So at a very young age, we were learning that kind of uh, good lesson. Um, the, the other, uh, I, we also went to school down the block at Emerson, uh, who uh, part was primarily 90% black. Uh, on the first day of school, I actually, um, Mrs. Flynn introduced me to Frederick. She says, Frederick, come over here and show Bayard around. And um, I wouldn't have guessed, but that week, somebody was trying to pick on me during recess. And Frederick came over and says, hey, excuse me, you're not going to be picking or fighting with, with uh, Bayard. You're going to fight with me if you can stuff. <laughs> so I, I I think I've lost him. Some kids that are just good, but not so nice. Can you hear me? Y yes, uh, uh, Mr. Fong. Okay, so yes, go ahead. Uh, continue and complete. Uh, you you've given them a great uh, background uh, and and in history. And, and it's, it, you, you're really doing a, a fabulous job because I don't think most Americans have any knowledge of, the chi of Chinese Americans uh, in terms of history. It's, it's not, as you know, as you mentioned, it's not taught in school, by the way, in most schools. Uh, and, and no one knows the immensity and, and gravity of their contribution to building the West and expanding the railroad. And, and of course, when I first came across that knowledge of, of, of them building the railroad, I said, oh, there was a Chinese that was also a steel driving man because, you know, John Henry was considered a steel driving man for black people. So historically, as a railroad builder, but, uh, but you have really pointed out some very interesting information. But let me ask a question. Were you ever in a position yeah. where you had to uh, talk about this notion, are you an American? Or are you a Chinese? Did you, is that, has that ever been an, a question that's been raised? And how did you respond to that? Well, I, I remember when I was a kid, they used to call me Ching Chong Chinaman. Uh, they might also refer me to as, as a Jap. And, uh, and I'd have to say, you know, no, I'm not. Um, and, uh, uh, the, the your other example, I'm trying to think. Um, it wasn't necessarily that I was called out. I, I remember right, waiting at a bus stop, and this uh, uh, African American uh, gal comes over to me. And she says, "Show me your kung fu. Come on, show me." You know, she puts her arm up and 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 stuff. I said, I just ignored her. You know, I, I just didn't know what to do. Um, the uh, another time was. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what situations. Um, well, I guess when we were in the shop at my grandpa's laundry, there would be a couple of kids outside the front just harassing us. But they were playing, but we didn't know it was bothering us. They were playing in front of the windows and the doors and just dashing around and, and, and hounding us and making faces and whatnot. But, you know, it was, I think it was kid play. Uh, but, you know, I think... Uh, yeah, that's that's the kind of things that I can remember. Maybe it can be a, a, another question, that, or maybe rephrase your question there. Uh, well, well, I think you you you've answered yeah. it in, in in a couple of ways, and I the the image that's projected by the media, whether it's entertainment, most Americans get their uh, notions of, of 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 Chinese people from. I remember my my in, in orientation certainly wasn't it any Chinese people. And when I grew up in Alabama, there are some now, 
but there was a time in Tuscaloosa, there was no Chinese, but they talk about Charlie Chan or some other images, stereotypical images that they, that people have tend to come to know uh, from movies. And many times that that image of, of, of Chinese uh, it is not reflected uh, in the media at all. Would you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, actually, those that description, Charlie Chan, actually was is just kind of irks my skin in the sense because uh, they were more caricatures, and they made they made all this makeup, and, and they were making these sounds that was very. Uh, kind of parroting, uh, making fun of us and how we spoke. And they did the slant eye thing. It, it was very derogatory. And then up, we, we didn't see people like us that were being treated respectfully. We didn't see that, that we were leaders, see that we were you know heads of households. We didn't get to see that we were cowboys. We didn't get to see that we were uh, even in the army and leading a pack. Uh, and the media basically left us out and, and movies and film. You know, I, I always asked, was there ever a show about a Chinese American family on TV that you can remember? I don't remember any, do you? You know, it's, it's just, it's really tough. Um, and so, for Bruce Lee came, came about, which all of us got, And I think other other members of our society and other groups as well. He's assertive. He's he's willing to fight the fight and and kind of win the day. And we didn't have too many of those heroes. We didn't. Have... I I see you breaking yeah. up, but uh, uh, you've answered. So it, was, the, you, it was kind of tough. You, yeah, you you've answered the question. Uh, let me ask you then. Currently, when we hear uh, national gonna... leaders talk about the, the, the virus. And when you hear the leader of this country, a former leader, talk about the virus being from Wuhan, China. What do you think about that kind of, of, of appeal that's been, which I consider racist uh, to the public, and at the same time, um, uh, creating this this animosity. So, what's your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I decided to try to move my seat to see if it's a better signal. I'm going to try to put me, my face back on and see if this helps. Well, you sound you sound great. Okay, good. So I'm going to try to get our video going too, if I can. Let's see if that's going to work. How's that? Let's see. If oh we yeah. Can help with that. Oh yeah. I'm going to turn this one off. It helps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, the Wuhan virus, you know, it's, we've seen it I've, so many times. They, they, they make fun of these various viruses and put a Chinese name on it and kind of like a put the blame game. Mm -hmm. And then people transfer that blame on us here in San Francisco or in America. And that's really unfair. And, 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 and uh, you know, we always end up saying, oh, here they go again. And that's not right. Um, and unfortunately, this was actually a, a real, it caused so much uh, fear and anguish because the reality is the undercurrent here in San Francisco in the Bay Area, and, and I think many parts of America, there's been violence going on against Asians, but it's under the radar. Mm -hmm. People aren't seeing the, the, the data about it. Uh, I discovered this, um, I think about, 10 years ago, uh, they held a rally outside City Hall uh, one Friday, and they called, used Chinese media, press, and radio to get the word out, hey, if you've been harmed or violated, uh, it had to do with that time when the two elders who were at, at the Muni bus stops, and they were slammed, and then they fell off and hit their heads, and they died. And so there was a question as to, what's going on with all this, right? So over 2,000 people showed up. And in all my years, I have never seen 2,000 of our Chinese community members show up at any rally that I can recall, except maybe 
the rallies when there was a protest between pro-China and pro-Taiwan groups fighting in, in our own community. Mm -hmm. But to my surprise, we had relatives there, cousins. I said, hey, what are you doing here? Well, we're responding to this call uh, for uh, testimony about incidences that have happened to our community members. My mother was hit on the head and her purse was stolen. I said, did you guys ever report it? And she said, no, that's the yeah. problem. That's part of the problem. So, you know, when this thing erupted this last year and a half or two, and I think that you're right, I believe, I agree with you that the president, our president's comments were really un unexcusable unexcusable um and uh i think we should find a way to prosecute them for this stuff i wish you know that's what i wish but it, somehow it seems like it's so difficult to do that well the justice calls for that <laughs> certainly certainly when we think about uh incendiary uh rhetoric that causes uh, incite folks to ride and and to commit crimes against the people so certainly uh, that if, you, if we're looking at a real democracy, as we talk about that as an ideal, justice cries out for that to be resolved. Uh, the, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you uh, in terms of this, this, this the, the, there was a bill that uh, President Biden signed into, or, into, into law, an uh, anti-Asian hate bill. Would you comment on that to our audience who may not be familiar with uh, what, what that bill was about? Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to re respond to your earlier comment and say that all this violence, it gets us fearful, it gets us angry, and it almost makes you wanna fight back in the same way. But you have to, we have to have a lot of extra restraint not to do that. And so we don't wanna copy what's, what's happening. So we want to, uh, like you say, um, break that that action, that model. That model is not the right model. So that is a huge challenge. But uh, you know, it felt like our our house was on fire every single day for over a year, and I, I just it was just it was just so much. But you know, I, I think it's also encouraged all of us to come around, just like you said at the top of the uh, this workshop. Let's figure out ways to solve this, to stop this, and to get to the roots and, and, and work together to solve what's happening at the roots, okay? And so let me, let me get back to your sec second, this question about um, uh, uh, President Biden. You know, his, um, his law is meant to uh, be supportive of stopping this anti-Asian hate. And it's meant to, to say the president of the United States sees and wants to be responsible to our communities. But I think he's also speaking for all communities because we should not have hate for anybody, whether you're Asian, Pacific Islander, Latino, white, and other countries, because our country is a country of people from all over this earth. We don't own it. We just happen to be people on this earth, right? And you know, I didn't have a chance to talk about the story that we were talking about earlier before, before we started this workshop is, I think that you know, science tells us that man probably came from America first and maybe Europe. And as they grew and, and migrated uh, to the east toward Asia, and then across the Aleutian landmass or taking boats or ships, get to the Americas, and South America, Central America, all populated in other, other countries. Of the, we're one people. We're one people. We should take care of each other. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I hope I'm trying to stay on your point there. Well, you, well, you stayed on a good point. And, and, and it's interesting as you talked about this concept of race, we all know scientifically it, it doesn't hold water. We, we, we know the myth and, 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 and the pseudoscience that has been created because most of us who, who've gone into the education system understand that in our anthropology classes where they taught us, well, there was only three races of folk 
and, and that sort of thing, which still didn't give us the real picture, the truth, the science, uh, and, and, and that we know that color has nothing to do with the kind of people that populates the planet. Uh, and we've had the experts deal with that question. The scientists have done their anthropological studies. We have the great scholars who ent entertain great debates around the, the question of race. As you know, this notion of low IQ, high IQ, uh, the model minority, you, you get all of these things mixed into a ball that, that confuses a number of people, but we don't have, I don't see the educational process uh, that I think must happen in order for folks to have an understanding and have the ability to have this conversation that we're having, yep. talking to people who, who from who are from different places. Yeah. Uh, like I, like here in in San Francisco, you had uh, the Chinese Exclusionary Act here, that that the Chinese could not buy property. And folks could not sell it to Chinese. You want to talk about that? Because I don't think a lot of folks know the history of the discrimination that took place legally here in California. And then, of course, we march down the street. If we march on down that line, we see the Japanese who was placed in camps. And that law, court, of course, is still on the books right away. But share in the, in your, your, your thoughts about that. I'm sure you ran into that discussion uh, on your Human uh, Rights Commission uh, yeah. when, when you had some discussion on these. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Canton. Well, you know, I, I think even since the 1840s, when the Chinese first came for the gold rush, uh, they, they were uh, passing laws to exclude them from being able to mine gold, number one. They were passing these labor laws and, and they were specifically targeting Chinese people. And then in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was for 20 years, was also another reaction. It was after the Transcontinental Railroad had been built. And um, I guess they were just, the people were uh, having, they didn't like the fact that the Chinese were doing all this labor and they were saying, how come we're not getting these jobs? So it was a lot of uh, jealousy over that, I think. And then, uh, but the pro problem of it, it, it got renewed. And it got renewed. And over time, they, they even, um, uh, I think it wasn't until uh, uh, 19, uh, after World War II, when they actually did have this uh, like uh, war brides uh, 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 ordinance that was passed that helped to uh, give people that fought in the war a chance to bring their wives over uh, because of what, what was happening for all the people that contributed to World War II were people of all color, people of all ethnicity. And, and so that was an important um, uh, process. The, um, the other thing that uh, comes to mind is, is also that the civil rights uh, ordinances that were passed, civil rights laws in, 18, in 1960s were really important because it was to stand up and stand up for civil rights, not just for African-Americans and they helped lead the way but we also joined in the fight because we also were not being treated fair. It turns out that in, in, in the eight, early 60s, uh, uh, our judge Harry Lowe, who was just a kid in, in, in law school over at Bolt Hall in Berkeley, uh, was fighting the fact that Chinese people, only Chinese, were limited to 105 people could immigrate all these years. The rest of the all the other ethnicities was 10,000. That's not right. All the way up to 1965. Peter. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that, you know, and then the, uh, the but after 65, then there was more people that started coming through. And so, you know, that was, um, we saw a wave of, of more migration. Well, you, you, you're really affirming uh, what I think in terms of people having an understanding of history. Because if you go back to the first Civil Rights Act in this country was in 1866. Now in 1866 was when they, they freed the slaves. And the idea was <clears throat> to set up this, this free man's bureau in order to bring the slaves into full humanity because they weren't considered human. 
So you've had a number of civil rights, you've had a number of laws. Uh, in 1896, the Judge Tanner, who was the Supreme Court Justice said that Blacks have no rights that any self-respecting white man should respect. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, ruled out of the law until 1954. Now, when we look at it historically, when, this, when these laws were set up, uh, and, and actually the question, many of those laws was never implemented. So here, when you look at the different groups in this country who have experienced what I call the American experience uh, and the cruelty that they all have experienced, yeah. but they're not, they don't, you're not taught that in school. Right. You don't, you're, you're not taught who the groups are, what were their experience, what was the Hispanic experience? What was the uh, uh, Filipino experience? What, you know, and so you got this mixture of folks. Now, one author says that we are a nation of strangers as a result of that. So I guess my question is, how do we stop being strangers? Well, I, you know, I, I'm just, first of all, I'm delighted to be on this call with you and everybody else who's on this call. I wanna welcome everybody number one, because this coalescing of what we're doing today is, is, is what I think it's, it's, it's at the root of it. As we start to get to know each other better and work on things like this important topic together. Uh, and you, you mentioned that we have a diversity in San Francisco, unlike probably any other city in the world. And we still have new immigrants coming every day. Everybody still wants to come to San Francisco. They come, want to come to America. So there's a richness and value in that diversity. And we should figure out how to embrace that. But we can use some of the tools that we use that we learned you know, growing up. Can we treat each other like brothers and sisters? And, then, and when we have differences, can we figure out how to work them out, right? And then uh, the, the other part that is to try to respect everyone just like you wanna be respected or we want our grandparent to be respected. We wanna re respect everybody else's grandparent, right? And so forth and children and so forth. So I think that the, if, you know, there's, we have a history of this. I mean, we formed coalitions during the civil rights movement with African-Americans, Filipinos, Latinos, whites, Asians, everybody. I think that's what we need to do now in 2020. We need to start this 2020s movement that it's everybody and we lock elbows, heart and mind and work together on education, on employment, on housing, on how our system works or doesn't work. Cause I think it's a lot of things that need our help but it's gonna take all of us jumping in together and no more sitting in the background. Um, you know, I think Unfortunately, I was thinking about it while I was talking to a friend this morning, is that we've been so uh, conditioned that we're not respected, that we're ignored, that we're not relevant. And even at the, uh, in the job, we don't even get looked at as possibly to be promoted. And that's a problem. And then so, but the reality is we do count. And we do a lot for everywhere we work for. And it's everybody, it's not just Chinese, it's every, everybody that cares for people and they care for what the job they do. And, and just because we're quiet or we don't talk to the manager because we're afraid to, you know, part of it is kind of like systemic racism. You're using the word, it's kind of ingrained in how we operate just to survive. Mm -hmm. And then past survival, now we got our education, now we got our means in a way are we, can we jump that, that next step where we actually can not be afraid and start to get involved and use our voices and communicate our heart and our spirit. We help lift the whole boat. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we're talking about. When I first met you, you, you know, uh, your, your terrific group here uh, and we have other groups. Uh, I recently met uh, four churches who are merging together, one a Buddhist, another Chinese Buddhist, Japanese Buddhist, and African-American uh, Methodist church, and another uh, church. And they're saying, let's use what's in the books 
that talks about treating each other together in kindness and, and solving problems, and not in anger and not in fighting. So I believe in that too. I, at the Human Rights Commission, for 20, 34 years, I had to learn how not to make anybody upset. That means you gotta use respect. That means you gotta have good heart. And you gotta do it in your actions and you have to carry out your actions. So anyway, I, I'm kind of helping to no, dive no, into- No, 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 you're there. drifting into a good, good okay. phase of our discussion here where right. you're talking about this question of, of religion where you, sh you, you, you would think folks are saying you got, you, you got one church and one God, but yet you have division there. So uh, it, it, it's amazing to hear you talk about these different uh, religions coming together to, uh, to, to take care of the business that they've been uh, actually put here to do. <laughs> right, I think really some of our ministers have said, hey, Let's open the doors and involve our communities again. It's about time. Yes. And then, you know, to me, whether you're just a regular person from the community, that's fine too. You don't have to be religious, but you are a people person. That's good enough. And that's important. And, you know, you, I think you're right on key there. And well, let me, let me ask you this. group, it's called We Are One. <laughs> we, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think Martin Luther King said it best. He says the most segregated day uh, in America is on Sunday. And what he observed was simply that you had these different churches, you know, the black church, the Chinese church, the Ch Japanese church. And he saw all, he, he saw those divisions that interfered with the ability of the collective efforts of, of folk serving, serving the people serving being of service because that's really what we're talking about how do we get the best results and have and recognize the competing images the, the competing interests are not divergent is interest yeah, yeah. but they're converging that's so correct. it seemed to me that as you talk you, you're really uh, illuminating the, the the challenge of of getting that done how we go about building yeah. a true coalition not one where we just go past our cars and shake hands yeah no that's not it <laughs> you know we, well, so, so, we've been there done that <laughs> you know I'm, I'm happy to say that the human rights commission had the leadership in the 60s to establish its ordinance and its anti-discrimination and employment program when i got there we were still doing uh stop you know trying to prevent and stop uh discrimination and employment in the city and so we had officers trained to do this work monitor projects monitor departments get departments to do their job um and then separately we would work with the community groups in each of our communities in san francisco the nonprofits that were working in the communities with our, our people all of our people and we would say okay if we can form a coalition and that's when we started building coalitions. It was a, it had to do with employment. And then also they were forming coalitions of uh, African-American contractors and supply houses, Asian contractors, uh, Latino contractors, white contractors, women in construction, women in business. And, and all of them together could go up to city hall and say, hey, we want this law. If it was one group went up there by themselves, nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. Only together were they able to make something happen. And then every four or five years, we'd have to look at that law and see if it was w working or not working. And then we'd ask everybody, what's really happening out there? Are you being discriminated? Tell us, give us the records. And then uh, and we're going to protect you and give you uh, anonymous, anonymous confidentiality. But we want to know what's really happening. So we would try to get that testimony so we, we could use that as a tool for us to defend our law using state and federal laws. And so, uh, you know, unfortunately we don't have that tool right now. I wish we could get that back soon, uh, but Prop 209 prevents us from using, uh, you know, uh, but we are communities. I can hear people pushing for diversity, inclusion and equity. So we have to create this new vibe that's all positive and not 
hitting people and harming people, but is including everybody. But I think you spoke very clearly in terms of, of, of alternatives and the kinds of things that must happen in order to uh, bring some change here. And certainly uh, those are the kinds of thoughts in terms of changing the way people are thinking about how, where we are as a nation in relationship to the vast diversity that we have in here in, in terms of how, uh, how rich it is. I, I don't think, you know, somebody told me they was going to, the, all, the, all the, the, the quote, African Americans moving back to Alabama. I can't go to Alabama. I like this place here. <laughs> in, in terms of diversity, now, the Alabama folks going to get mad and, and, and pull that roll tide stuff on me, you know. I, 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 I've been there too with that football. The, football is a religion in, in that place. But so I like the idea that you have presented. Some, Dr. Some... Tanner, can I add something? And I, yes, I'm, I'm going I'm to say this to you. So I would love to go with you to visit your home state and have that experience. And I would like to take you to Chinatown and have an experience here in San Francisco the way, the way I see it. Well, I tell and you, we can makes... start doing this kind of exchange of real sharing, well, not you... just, you know, that's well, you, you, you know, that actually happened in South Central L.A. after the ride there uh, where, where the African-American child got killed by a Korean person, uh, a shop owner. Uh, they came together and actually created a uh, like a, a exchange program yeah. where they got children coming from the schools uh, in South Central L.A. going to going to uh, uh, South Korea. So that, 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 that exchange is rich, but you wouldn't see the Alabama I left. Right. You, would see a, you would see a different Alabama. Hopefully it's a lot better. <laughs> well, you know, the flags are gone. Okay. Uh, the, 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 Confederate, the Confederate generals are gone, but you still got whispers of the lost cause. Uh. <laughs> so, okay. But you got that. I like that idea of exchange where people start doing that. I mean, folks could do that on an individual level, get to know people of different eth ethnic group and actually go yeah. to the community, uh, see what people are doing, yeah. have a conversation. But one of the things I found, uh, Mr. Fong, is that you got to be willing to be vulnerable when, when you don't yeah. know anything about other folks. And I don't I think, think a lot of yeah. a lot of folks don't like to be vulnerable and say, you know, I don't know. See, I'm one of these people that will say I don't know. You know, uh, Dr. Cantor, that reminds me of a, a key point that happened this year, this past year. Uh, Black Lives Matter, huge. Um, my, myself, my family, my community members, we went out to support these Black Lives Matters march, try to understand better how how to. How can we help? So uh, I, I was out on the Great Highway. I was in the Mission. I was in the Bayview. I was on, you know, I went to three or four of these, okay? But, and then the Asian hate started to happen. And then, you know, some of my compadres, um, colleagues would say, well, what about us? And unfortunately, um, some of our, our African-American um, um, sisters and brothers were saying, well, it's Black Lives Matters now. And I'm sitting there shaking my head, you know, my human rights background tells me, no, it's Black Lives Matters, Asians Lives Matters, every lives matters. We should all stand up together. So the next time I see that young man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna correct him. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, and, and, and you got a good point. You, you also know that uh, the African-Americans have always been the poster child for racial incidents. Uh, the African-American is the one you see uh, being choked out. We know other people get choked out, but the newspaper really don't report those. Yeah. So they are underreported and, and, and African-Americans highly is, is, is projected at, at that level. And I don't think it's been done, it's done uh, strategically to promote uh, division, even though the, the you, even, I've seen uh, police brutality on white guys, 
but you don't see that. Yeah. Uh, and 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 so my concern is as we get into this, you're dealing with a system that can be very pernicious in its division. Pernicious in the sense that it it makes it seem like these political slogans that come up sort of uh, uh, is isolated. Well, certainly you got to deal with the whole whole cloth because injustice is injustice. So. I'm not saying I got the answer, but we got to be able to to confront what you just said and say, how do we deal with this to promote better understanding, if you will? Well, you know, Dr. Cantor reminds me another key point I wanted to bring up is a part of this, uh, as your intro, you said the goal of this workshop is what can we do individually? And so the first thing that comes to mind, I think COVID offered a positive thing where basically everybody was sent home and there was a chance to reconnect with family, reconnect with maybe your neighbors that you hadn't talked to hardly, uh, maybe actually have a block party. We had a block party that one of the families had a, a guitar and, a, and a, a, a drum and they said, let's play some music together. Let's sing together. And you know, when I first moved uh, to this neighborhood, I would make a point to go on Halloween to knock the door with every everybody on our block and up the block and down the block and bring my kids uh, one by one or two by two or three by three, as it turned out, to meet them. And, and I don't know, you know, I, it's because I've been, like you said, doing this all my life is trying to make these connections. So it makes for a safer block for everyone. It makes a safer block for my kids. It makes a safer block for their kids. Mm -hmm. And it makes a safer block for their parents and their grandparents. And it makes a safer block for my parents and grandparents. So if we can start to reactivate this, this thing, it's here, it's wonderful. I grasped it, you grasped it, everybody probably in this call has grasped it. We need to do more of that. Well, it's kind of interesting as you talk about the, the, the challenge that the pandemic brought. I mean, uh, it, 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 you found divorces increase. I mean, there's a dark oh. side. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Murders of spouses increase. <laughs> and the, 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 the seemed, America's a strange. It, it seemed to me that adversity tests them in ways that they've never been tested before. And yeah unseemly things happen because what they found that the job kept folks in their home <laughs> because folks went to work. They, they didn't have time to be at all. Now that, that was sort of a, a side consequence, but my point, the point I'm raising is that we're amidst all these challenges, it still comes to who are we as a people yeah. and all, this nation is a nation of everybody. I mean, even the folks who tell me to go back to Africa is telling me to go someplace I've never been and someplace that they claim that was not theirs because Columbus discovered somebody who was already here if he came here at all. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that, and that's the hit, real history. Did, did he really show up? And who was here before he arrived, which was the indigenous folk? who had their own way, way of life. So knowing the history and understanding the conglomerate history of all of, our, of, of all of the people in America makes for a rich heritage. It makes for a rich understanding. In the absence of that, we're dealing many times in a vacuum with no information. And we got to be willing to, to acknowledge and I, I don't use this word in a pejorative sense, we have to acknowledge our ignorance. In order to acknowledge your ignorance, you got to be vulnerable, you know, because it's, it's very difficult if your ignorance has boasted your self-esteem and how yeah. you see yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so, you, you use a certain, there's a term I kind of like, remi reminds me of it's humbleness and being humble. Yes. Um, I think the, 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 the reality I feel in San Francisco is, uh, you know, it was a lot of pride when Ed Lee was, was the mayor and he was saying, I get things done. 
well, we should all get things done. And there's a saying that if anybody can do it, uh, San Francisco can do it. San Francisco used to lead the way. We can and we will return to leading the way. But everybody on this call, we need you to join each other's uh, resources here and let's rally up. It's time, it's now. <laughs> Okay, Honorable Fong, you know, now is the time we entertain questions from the, 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 the audience, I believe. And uh, this has been rich. Uh, and I've been, as they would say in, in my community, I've been richly blessed by your presence. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Me too. So, so uh, it, I believe I, we go back to Mary. Yeah, thank Mary. you. Thank you, Dr. Canton. Uh, I'm going to take some of the questions, and uh, I believe Dr. Honeycutt has been vigorously taking notes there <laughs> and has got a lot of questions herself. Her mind is always uh, trying to get more information on things. And uh, Mr. Falling, it was just excellent, excellent conversation, great information. Um, I'm going to just go from the top. I have some greetings here, even. So it's just some statements, even. I'll, I'll read those out. Uh, Commissioner. Linda Richardson just wants to welcome everyone. Uh, so thank you, Commissioner Linda. Richardson. Thank um, you. Always excellent to have her. She's got so much knowledge as well. The first question, let's see, is yes, we were streaming live on Facebook. Um, yes, these videos will be up on the website as well. Um, live stream to Facebook and YouTube. Um, and this is from Ten Tendi Tendai Jordan. And it says, uh, what is the term for this conversation of what term Pacific Islanders included? So how do you how do you see Pacific Islanders included in the in the sort of broader Asian category? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Actually, sometimes they're synonymous. Uh, having had the chance to work for the Census Bureau, uh, they use the term Asian Pacific Islanders often. But you and I know, or most people may not be aware, actually, uh, I shouldn't say that, but some people may not be aware is it's made up of 45 countries of origin are under the API Asian Pacific Islander category, 45 countries. Can you imagine that? And then earlier in this, uh, the discussion where uh, Dr. Cantor had those to chart for Asians, it was uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and then uh, Asia part, which is usually China, Korea, Japan, and so forth. But then Southeast Asia would be Burma, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Burma, um, Vietnam, and so forth. And then Indian subcontinent would be India, Bangladesh, Bang Pakistan, and so forth. So the Pacific Islander community is uh, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, all the islands that are out there, um, including uh, uh, Guam, Samoa, uh, Tonga, uh, Hawaiian islands are considered actually Pacific Islanders as well. And there's many, many other countries uh, out there that I, I just can't off the top of my head rename, but yeah, there's a lot. And then to call us one group is ridiculous. We don't speak the same languages. We don't. We can't read the same languages. It sounds so, like 46 different languages, just a, <laughs> at a minute. <minimum. yeah. laughs> <laughs> exactly. So thank you very much for that question. That's an excellent question. OK. And then the next question, and, and thank you, Tendai. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right. You Maybe at some point, you'll please let us know. Um, t t t yeah, I, uh, I'd like to add, Tendai. Yeah, so please. The, go ahead, Bear. The, the, the key, though, and you bring this up, and it's a good bring up. We can't just, if we're reaching out to Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Filipino, but that's good enough. No, like you said, there's 40 other country folks that, that need our attention. They're, they're under the radar of the big radar that we're under the radar. Well, you really are under the radar. So let's get you got everybody included in the radar. So um, I'm the first one to continue to accentuate that for myself. I, I'm going to make that part of my part of my, what I do now. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Um, 
And I'll, I also wanted to point out that uh, the Honeycut website uh, has a number of really good resources uh, on the various topics we've been covering in our workshops, uh, but especially on just racial racial issues and systemic white supremacy. Um, Tendai uh, has another question. Uh, so anyone could take this one on. Can you speak to the rift between African-Americans and Asians? And it's a, it's a double question. What race has perpetrated the most attacks on Asian people? Mm. I think I, I can give a response. And, and, and my response is that there's no accurate number, but there've been a significant number of African-American youth in San Francisco who have attacked uh, uh, Senior, senior, senior agents, and but in terms of that number, you when you when you do numbers, you can become very divisive in saying, you know, who commit the most crime. Uh, I just think when we look at the whole picture, those those attacks against people can be resolved by people in 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 the in the community, and I think the uh, education system plays a part because I think it's, it has failed the American society significantly by not having uh, a program. I, at one time, they was debating whether in California you would have an ethnic study requirement in, the, in the, all of the universities to graduate. Some courses on dealing with the, the, the differences and understanding historically, because I don't think until you get there, you can really, because uh, you get into political play with, you know, well, they did this, the, 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 they're doing the most crimes against the people, but the, the, it needs to be resolved. And I think my solution is one way is, is to straight talk it and be true and not play games with it. Because here you could argue, well, they gave the agent of, I've heard this one, they got an apology, okay? We didn't get an apology for slavery. Well, both needed to be repaired and repaired because of the damage that's been done to both groups. No repairing has been done. And of course, with, now politically, I go back to the war on poverty and I'm, I'm a soldier, so I'm always wondering, I wondered when they was gonna declare victory. You know, this war, I mean, we spent billions of dollars on, 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 on war on poverty. And of course, most studies show that much of that money went back to corporations who had not been, been, been spread the wealth. So in terms of building a community, and I think we have to go there. A, 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 a nation whose cities are poor it's, it, it's also poor. A nation as wealth as ours with people sleeping on the streets, no excuse for that. The crime rate, because people, if you, if you notice, there's a high correlation between crime and unemployment. And if you live in a place where I live, unemployment is, unemployment is, is down, and so it's crime. Yeah, and I and, think... and, uh, uh, and and I think that's the, I, I'm some, I'm looking at it from that standpoint, and, and of course, uh, Mr. Fong, you 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 open for your comment as well on this subject. Thank you, Dr. Canton. Actually, you brought up a good point. It has to do with jobs because if you look at the history of San Francisco, uh, when they built the shipyards and they needed to build all those ships in the '40s and, and during the wars. Uh, a large influx of African American worker labor came to San Francisco, and 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 they were raising families, and 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 uh, they had jobs, and that was excellent. But then the shipyard closed, and even uh, I'm learning from from colleagues that I've I've been uh, hanging out with a lot that when the USS Missouri was here. There was a lot of people that had jobs maintaining those ships, but when they let it go and it went down to, I guess, San Diego or something, there weren't a lot of jobs. Well, where are the jobs? 
how do we have access to the jobs for all of our people here in San Francisco? So we've, that's one of the problems to solve, jobs. And then the other thing I think is um, historically, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, actually some of our labor unions uh, in, in the trades are doing well, but some are not. Some can do a whole heck of a lot better. And, and we need to work with them and our, our, our various unions to show how best practices can work. And, you know, I think that's an important thing. Now, you mentioned that Blacks are, uh, are causing the damage. You know, I, I think that's not a fair way of phrasing it because it's some individuals who happen to be African-American, you bear, perhaps. I just wanted to offer yeah. up just a, a brief statement of the question. It says, oh, just okay. talk, talk about the rift between African-Americans and Asians. And then the second question was, uh, what group has perpetrated yeah. the most amount of violence? And, and the me, the question me, didn't suppose it was African American. Before oh, okay. we leave that, I'm I sorry think, about that. My I mistake. think your choice of words, <laughs> okay. the words, the riff, the riff is, is 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 a political structure that have folks in different communities having the same interests competing for the same interests, and it's a oh. game that's played. Now, if you can, you can, you've come up with some community ambassadors where you, you're working and bringing, bridging a gap there in the community of connections. If you've got a program, I, I think San Francisco talked about community ambassadors. I might come down yeah. and find out wh what they've been doing lately, but, <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing you would think need, that's one of the small things that I think can happen. To, re to relieve some of these issues. There's not enough people knowing and having an understanding of the peoples in our communities. Yeah, okay. So I have some more questions here in the chat. Let me um, Thank you, Thor. bring them up and get these questions out there because people, information is burning on people's minds and they want to know, okay. why minds want to know. Um, this chat, there we go, okay. Um, so there's a couple of statements. Angela Toy says, people should consciously make friends and, and make friends with people outside their ethnic background to expand understanding and learn how to get along and not be afraid of other races of people. Our youth needs to be comfortable with all people to make us feel, to make us feel less fearful and racist. I think that's an excellent, an excellent point. Um, and Portia Ria Pat, Pat, Patton, Pat, I'm messing Thank up Thank you, this. Angela, that's a good point. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Messing up uh, Portia's last name, Patton, it looks like. How do you feel about the Asian American representation shown in mainstream media, like Shang-Chi crazy, rich Asian, fresh off the boat, et cetera? Uh, could someone speak to Portia's question? Sure, I'll start. Okay, doctor? It's okay with you. Okay, um, you know, Crazy Rich Asian it had a lot of hype. I ran out to go see it. Um, it probably wasn't a fair depiction of Asians, but movies tend to do that. Um, not everybody's rich like that. That's like way up there in the echelon, whatever it is, the top one percent or top five percent type folks. But that's that's not that's not us. That's not me. That's not my community. Um, so that's not a, that didn't help. And maybe people might put stereotypes on us that we're all rich like that and all that. No, no, that, that's not correct. Um, and then Shang-Chi, you know, it, to me, Shang-Chi was a pretty good movie for, from my point of view, because uh, I felt it helped elevate uh, strength, standing up to adversity, and you can be the hero. Well. When did you see a last actor that was Chinese American that was a hero? Who can remember that? Uh, you know, so this is rare and far, few between. Every 20, 30 years, you get somebody? I don't know. But, you know, I think uh, we need to do more movie making and, and we want to encourage that, especially showing the real lives of, of many people, not just Chinese Americans, but everybody that 
like you said, we all share a lot of commonality over the last week or two that we've had a chance to share stories even with Dr. Honeycutt and Miss Mary River, Rivers and, and um, uh, others, uh, Thor, you know, we all share a lot of commonality don't realize, mm -hmm. you know, and once we start sharing it and hearing it, you say, oh, that reminds me of what happened to me when I was growing up. So I learned a lot of the same things. So, so like, like Angela said, if we can get together at a more intimate level, not just chit chat, shake hands, but go past that and get into, um, I think uh, Mr. Masato on the call there. Hello, Masato, good to see you. Um, he was telling, he, he, he has an exercise class over at the Pagoda in the morning. Everybody's invited and let's exercise together and let's laugh together. And, and so I showed up just to see what that was about. And he was laughing and I went out there laughing too. I said, ha, 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 ha. And apparently laughing <laughs> activates these good uh, yeah. hormones in your yes, body. It yes, it and does. we don't get enough laughing, <laughs> right? So, yes. you know, let's, let's, that's what we need to do is more of this stuff, right? And then I, we were all blessed and he, he invites us in for breakfast and we had a healthy breakfast after. So then you get the chance to yik yak some more and get to know people more. So yeah, let's do, let's continue doing that. Yeah, come, come. Thank you, Bear. <laughs> more, more, over, more over there, he says. All right, we have uh, three more questions and I wanna get to Dr. Honeycutt's questions. Um, so Anju says, uh, I'm going to read their question first, read Anju's question first, and then tell you the context of the question. So the question is, how do we promote diverse citizenship and collaboration when these statements are encouraged in the Black community? The statement Anju is referring to, um, this person, I, I'm assuming Anju is a woman, I don't know, but Anju said that she was at a Black Lives Matter panel. Uh, and two speakers were talking about needing more black banks and financial uh, orga uh, uh, organizations, structures, uh, to support black owned businesses. And Andrew says it's, they agree with that. The next sentence was one of the speakers wondered why there were so many Asian owned banks. I'm just saying, in quotes. Uh, and as an Asian person, uh, they were shocked, especially as the mainly black audience clapped and cheered. Uh, so how do you promote versus citizenship collaboration when you have statements like that being made uh, amongst different communities? I, I think one of the things that separates uh, the immigrant who came to America that they never were separated from their homeland. In other words, the Chinese, Chinese. I, I, I'm always comparing my situation as a poster child. Now the poster child came here in, in chains. And in the process of coming in chains, I went through name definitions change. You know, I was colored, black, Negro, nigger, and all of those names were given by the oppressor, including changing my name. You know, I become Smith, Jones. Yeah. Uh, so if you're searching the history, history books, you would know what contribution was made simply because under the system of slavery, everything, including my creativity, was taken away. So the, the, uh, the notion of, of, and this is why the, in, in reconstruction, why it, fa it failed, if it had worked, we wouldn't even have, be having this conversation because in the reconstruction package, if the, everybody talked about the 40 acres and the mule, no, they talked about education. They talked about a banking system so that, so, so, so they are under, the folks who understood that the people have been ripped apart and they needed those things in place to be made whole. Now, and, 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 and I wanna engage the conversation because here you got, you, you do have banks and I think having a sense of who you are and the land connection makes a difference in terms of your identity. 
African-American psychologists talk about, we have to look for our identity. You know, I get, the, I get content, I get information, folks say, why you never been to Africa before? How you gonna be in Africa? Wait a minute, now, obviously I came from somewhere and that same, that somewhere came from my roots. My roots was African slave trade. That's how I got here in the first place. And I knew my grandmother. My grandmother was a sharecropper. She lived to be 100 years old. So the, the, the point that I'm raising is a different experience, but not less important. I think people place a lot of importance on uh, uh, making the differences, but you still got to understand uh, uh, and put it in proper context. I'm always talking about context. Because you gotta, I think once you understand the context of, 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 of these different American experiences and how I discovered this, I taught a course at San Jose State on the multicultural history of America. And in that course, it, I covered every group and every group was in the room. You know, the Vietnamese was in the room, the uh, Filipinos were in the room, Hispanics was in the room, uh, Jews was in the room, it was a very exciting class. And of course, it's the role, as you know, the, the, the facilitator is to make it provocative. <laughs> That's my role. And my role, but make it educational so folks can begin and connect the dots. And I think once you're able to connect the dots, because Hollywood has, has done a, 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 a heck of a job framing the image of everybody. And, and we're still dealing with some of those images. For a long time, African Americans didn't have American have a family showed on television. They always showed broken family, all kinds of crazy stuff that, that we found. So this is why I look at it as a system, uh, Brother Fong. I look, look, I look at a system because I can apply system thinking that logically understand the design and function and racism is simply the fuel that drives the engine. Yeah. But when you but when you see it as a system, I mean, it's hard for folks to wrap their heads around it because you you're emotionally involved. But you gotta yeah. under, I think you gotta understand, and we 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 gotta do a better job in education. I mean, even if you if you if you got people reading, I mean, you do you realize the number of folks in America that read at the seventh grade level? Mm. It's amazing. We're about 37, 37 in the world in terms of reading English. 37 for a nation of wealth. It's a shame. And so in the absence of information, and you remember, we had a former president that said what? I love the uneducated. <laughs> mm. Now, if, if you listen to the man, and instead of you know kissing him off like he's stupid, he said he's telling you who he is and what he does right in your face. And what he said was he he don't care about folks. He himself is not educated. He didn't have to. He had money. He can just you know he can go bankrupt 20, 30 times. I go one. They tell me it it, it stays on my record for twenty years. <laughs> Wow. Depress, depressing my FICO score, right? <laughs> Speaking of the FICO score, let me let me squeeze Bayard in here, and then we got some more questions. Bayard, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, From Thor, Anju. would you would you mind repeating that question yeah. for me? Yeah, it, it was it was in reference to the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, panel that they were at about Asians having a lot of banks and uh, why aren't there not enough Black banks and. So the question was, how do we promote diverse citizenship and collaboration? Uh, sometimes when within ethnic communities, uh, people feel a little like some, some things are said that are derogatory. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's, it, I, this is a, that's a challenging question, to be honest. Um, I think I, I go back to the, if we look at humans are part of this global society. And America tends to think we're we're it, but it, it doesn't just revolve about around us only. It revolves about all of us on this earth. Yes. That's number one. So 
Um, so given that, those that have, if they can help with the banking, uh, they should benefit and offer to others. I'm, you know, mutually agreeing with that idea and that we should have that, encourage that. Because some people have the wherewithal, okay? And maybe it's not just white folks. It could be some Asians who have banks because uh, some people are able to make money like who are from Hong Kong or Japan or Korea or whatever, right? That, that, that can muster it. Well, they can help serve this global society. So let, let us do, let's get to it, right? And then the other thing was, um, anyway, I think hopefully that answers that question a little bit. Yeah. And if I could say, and Dr. Hanika may have something to say about this as well. If I can say, if somebody is doing something that you want to do, get with them and ask them how they did it. Learn from everybody you can. You know, Dr. Canton often and Dr. Hanika talk about education. That's why they got doctors in their names. Um, educate yourself about how to do something you see someone else doing. There's nothing wrong with that. And hopefully they want to help you. Good point. Um, so Commissioner Linda Richardson, and this is the final question, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Honeycutt after this. Um, she says, number one, hello, Bayard. Uh, Hi, Commissioner. You guys, <laughs> you guys work together at uh, the Human Rights Commission. Um, yes. And she's, she's speaking to education, and she says, um, uh, school Oh, it's kind of breaking up. So are you breaking up? I didn't hear that. Yeah. Yeah. He's he stopped my video for a second. Okay. Is this better? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 We can hear you. Perfect. She says she's referring to the education system in San Francisco. And mm -hmm. she says, what's your assessment of the school district lowering the math standards and how can it be reversed? Um, and there's a second part to her question, which is about the recall of certain board members um, and major reform. But uh, what do you think about the math standards being lowered? Well, doctor, you want me to go first on this one? <laughs> okay, wait, I'll wait. go first. Yeah, you Number go one, first. I do not agree with that because, you know, I, I worked hard at St. Mary's. Uh, from fourth grade to eighth grade in a Catholic school setting. And when I got to Marina and Galileo, I, you know, I had to work hard in math there too. I was gonna be pre-med. I had to have my math down. And even to get into Cal, you're competing with other people from all over the United States. They have their math down. So to lower it, I think might made our own people un uncompetitive. Uh, our own students uncompetitive in the process that to me that's an error. Um, uh, Commissioner Richardson, you, you, you had some questions about our, our Board of Education. Um, uh, Thor, would you help re restate that again for me? Make yeah, sure so at it clear, they, correct. Um, actually, now that I'm reading it, it's not quite a question. It's more of a statement. Um, just oh. hope she's hoping for major reform. In this yeah. in the San Francisco yeah. school district, yeah. um, and uh, you know when you see the standards being lowered, she was questioning whether or not that had any efficacy and effectiveness. But I think you addressed that. Um, yeah. It is seven thirty-eight. I want to turn it over to Dr. Honeycutt. Uh, I know she has some comments and questions she'd like to raise. All right. Thank you very much. This discussion is so rich and wonderful. It's just uh, exciting. I'd like to work a little bit with what Commissioner Linda Richardson was asking. Uh, Bayard, uh, in okay. terms of the recall of the three board members, uh, he asked, "What do you think uh, about this? Will this result in a major in major reform finally?" And so she'd like to get your opinion on that. Um, I think it could. It very well could. Mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes. I think it would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. It's it's a very touchy issue. I mean, it's it's difficult to assist with the the re, this uh, this recall is, is I think it's the first time we've done this in San Francisco for a school board. But I think the education of our kids, our children, uh, to to so many of us, every one of us here, is, is so vital and important in our public schools. And we need to have the best public school possible that serves all of our kids. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest um, 
And uh, when I ran for school board in 06, you know, one of my platforms was quality schools in every neighborhood. You can do that with solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Doctor? All right, so now uh, there, you have to understand that I'm also known as Dr. Straight Talk. Okay, Dr. Straight so Talk, these, okay. These questions that I have, they, they're not gentle necessarily, but okay, they are okay. trying to get information uh, about your perspective in terms of the Asian experience and specifically here in San Francisco. Right. So, right. and I'm, I'm uh, kind of put them all together. I can't ask all of them, unfortunately. But uh, here's one question. Asians are often considered to be foreign, subversive, and suspect. How have Asians gotten past these malicious and inaccurate stereotypes? Uh, first of all, we have to ignore it and deflect mm -hmm. it off the back of our head and behind us, mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. is we have to stand there very straightforward, straight talk, straight face, Mm -hmm. and say, excuse me, uh, what is it that you have a problem with? And, mm -hmm. and you, you know, you're there to help the situation. You're not here to make the situation wor worse. Uh, that kind of talk is, doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, when I say something about someone, I wanna make sure that it's something that I wanna model for my kids. Mm -hmm. And anything, everybody here on this table, if I'm saying something to my, I'm, I'm afraid to tell my kids I've said, because I don't want to embarrass myself, I shouldn't say it, mm -hmm. and I shouldn't do it, that's what I think. Thank you, Bayard. Um, uh, what accounts for the disparity in educational and economic attainment between Chinese and Japanese folks on one hand, and, and the Southeast Asians, like the Hmong and the, and the Cambodians, on the other hand. I mean, yeah, what, what's involved? Um, I think I have some insights there. Um, I think with what I understand a bit about the Hmong and the uh, what was the other group you mentioned? Cambodians. Cambodian. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, or Vietnamese there, and the, yeah, the Southeast yeah. Asian folks. Yeah, they're, they're different populations, number one. They're different mm -hmm. cultures. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is having to dig out of what we call survival mode mm. and having resources around you that can assist. And, you know, San Francisco, we worked hard on getting language access, translations mm -hmm. in Spanish, Chinese, um, maybe Vietnamese. And many of our populations don't get that right now. They're not getting that help. And so mm -hmm. that speaks to that question that uh, uh, Tinden brought up about APIs. Mm -hmm. There's 45 different countries under that category. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason that they, and then if they're isolated, like let's say they're into farming down in Fresno, the, these families, then they don't have much support systems built in. They're out in the farm raising, you know, uh, making a living, raising crops, and then and coming to market to sell them. And they don't really have time to, um, I think at a time, they have to make the time to run that business and run a farm, which is full time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of it. And, um, I, and I think probably the kids are putting, put to work too, to help at the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, here in San Francisco, we don't have a farm to go work at. I mean, yeah, yeah, I used to help at my grandma's and grandpa's uh, laundry, and I would help in my dad's restaurant in the summer when I had to visit him. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know. Dr. Cantor, do you have some other thoughts about that between the two? Well, I, I think there's a common strand when it comes to family uh, the, and family unity, how the, these groups uh, tend to be very strongly family oriented. And it lends itself in terms of, of I, I don't like the word assimilation, but it, it does in fact produce those generation of children that moves into the American society, uh, but at the same time maintaining a strain of a connection with their culture. 
You know, I, I would add one other thing too, is the Hmong or Cambodian people, they, San Francisco, if you know San Francisco, which we know, because we, we were born, we were raised here, uh, they came in 1840s, 1860s, 1900s, 2000, you know, and they established these support systems to help, help the residents. Uh, the family associations organized. There were enough of them to organize. They had to because they had no protection outside of their jurisdiction of Chinatown. You know, you had, you couldn't go past Broadway. You couldn't go past Van Ness. You couldn't go past Market. You just had to stay in your little corner here. You couldn't rent and you couldn't buy property. Well, you know, it's, it's a different world when you go out to the outer world and you don't have resources. It's very tough. Well, so Peter, I think that's me, part of it. Yeah. Peter, uh, one of the things I observed with, with a Korean friend that I know is that in terms of finances, there's a process where they put money aside. I, I, they got a name for it where once that money is set aside, that person can take that money and go get, get a business. Let's say do a turnkey operation. Uh, they, so they, they don't have to go to the bank to deal with the humiliation of FICA scores and all that stuff, but they have enough trust among themselves where that financial institution is structured uh, in, 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 in a, uh, a cultural way. Mm. And that hadn't been broken in many cases. Interesting. And so, so it's a defense against racism and also it gives them the financial ability to stand strong in, in, a, in a capitalist society. Yeah. I mean, that, that's not taught in the history books, by the way. Yeah. Okay, so I have one last question. I'm gonna to have to merge it together because I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Okay. Uh, of the folks here. And so, but this is an interesting question. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I, let, me, let me state it this way. Have Asians achieved parity with whites? in terms of income and level of education. Now, I, let me give you some backdrop on that. Uh, Michael Omi, in his essay, The Unbearable Whiteness of Being, does state a comment about many more Asians being considered to be honorary whites in terms of their economic and educational status. So, the question he kind of raises in that, and I wanted to present it to you, Bayard, have Asians been incorporated in the collective notion of who is white? Mm. I think that's an unfair question. Why is uh, it unfair? Let, let me see if, if I can answer it. Okay. so. No, it's no, it's, it's easy, uh, uh, Bayard. Yeah, uh, because Asians have been successful in getting edu yeah. educated. I mean, if yeah. you look at most of the, yeah. the colleges, I, what is Cal Berkeley? Forty-six yeah. percent Asian. You know, yeah. you go around and you see these wonderful percentages of Asian students who yeah. are achieving. So, yeah. are they getting to the point where they are uh, on? And then when you pull fold in the other groups. Okay, then you have fewer whites that okay. are achieving at that level. So, is does how does that impact on your ability as an Asian to navigate through life and to you know have family uh, involved and supported? I guess that's yeah. the best way I can put. It. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I think I. In get other it. words, are Asians considered uh, white people now? I'm, I'm breaking it down as much as I can, Beard. <laughs> because of their, they uh, might be, their, they might be their success with, uh, they might be, a, they might have similar income levels. Uh huh. Uh, if they have similar educational levels, but I think you know, let's get back to the original statement I said we were talking about earlier. We're all mm -hmm. one people. Mm -hmm. So w why do we have to differentiate this and call it out? That doesn't help anything. Uh, right. What we could do is, is you, you might be asking, are there specific values in education that 
Chinese or other Asian people really hold dear. Yeah, that's one of them. Mm-hmm. It's top top of the rung, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But like when my grandma says, Bayard, you're going to be a doctor. Mm-hmm. And maybe I didn't become a doctor, but you know, I I think I became sort of a doctor in human rights and a doctor in promoting diversity and equality. And so I'm proud to tell my grandma and look up and, and say say that to her, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But thank Brother you for Fong. that sweet talk question. Right. Well, I mean, and 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 here's the thing, um, you know, we we kind of resist these categories of who is yeah. white and who isn't. Yeah. But you'll find yeah. occasionally Asian people addressing that in those terms. Uh, uh, and so yeah. I just wanted to see what you thought about that idea. Okay, we know yeah. that those that that race is a construct. Yeah. And a false one at that. Okay, yeah. because we're all God's right. children, as far as I'm concerned. Correct. But I just thought I, that, that, you know, there's there seems to be some, there may be some envy there that Asians are being so successful. Look, I'm like this. If someone in another group, my Asian brothers and sisters or my Jewish brothers and sisters are having success in getting their kids educated and into key jobs and doing good stuff for the society, maybe I need to look over there and see what they're doing and maybe perhaps mimic some of that uh, or at least impart that information to other people that I know who yeah. want to reach those same kinds of levels, okay? Because not right. everybody does, yeah. right? That's so uh, I, I think you answered as best you can and thank you for letting me put you on the spot. Well, let uh, me ask you. Let you me, know, let, let, my name is Dr. Straight Talk, so you let, know I'm gonna do that. Dr. Let, Jeff, let, let me say something. Talk? Let me say something. Fannie Lou Hamer, mm-hmm. the famous quote was, when a, when a white man asked her, mm-hmm. are you trying to be equal to white people, mm-hmm. white men? She says, I don't want to stoop that low. No. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's great. Uh, that's Dr. Fannie Lou Dr. Hamer. Dr. Hanukkah, I would like to say one thing, though. Yes, please. There's statistics that show in corporations up in the Silicon Valley, up to San Francisco, mm-hmm. Asians are not faring well in management positions. Mm-hmm. They're well below their percentages than any other group. So there's some more st- things to look at in this big ch- challenges that we all have to try to figure out. And uh, we got a lot of work ahead of us, but I yes. hopefully we can all muscle up together with good hearts, good minds, and we yeah. work together. So let me, let you, me recap from what Amen. I've heard you say, uh, uh, Bayard. And Thor, I'm just going to take it over and then take it out, OK? Sounds uh, good. I love it. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, there there is work to do. And we do not have time to argue with one another. I, I'm very pleased, Bayard, that you talked about what a person can do in his or her personal life to not have exercise hate against any group, including Asians, okay? I'm right. very pleased that you talked about spiritual matters uh, in terms of how we interact with one another, loving one another, being kind to one another. That's the way many of us were raised. Right. Uh, so, so I'm very pleased about that as well. I did wanna thank you, Bayer and you, Dr. Canton, for your participation tonight. Uh, this, uh, this has been a, a wonderful uh, presentation. It truly has. And I want you to know that behind me is my book. And I'm gonna give one plug for this book, Straight Talk, <laughs> How to Survive and Thrive as a Young Man of Color. Uh, this is a book that is spiritual and it, is, it does not mince words about what you need to be involved in. Uh, in terms of living your life well. And we have much work to do. Bayard, you're absolutely right. I walked into a neighborhood and found out that uh, 14% of the people were having problems with drugs and were succumbing to fentanyl in San Francisco. I won't tell you what neighborhood it is, but it's in San Francisco. We've got work to do. We've got to get people to understand that they cannot, uh, no drug can uh, uh, substitute for the pain or whatever you're feeling. And unfortunately, far too many of our young people are gonna get, are getting hooked as well. So, I mean, in the book, Straight Talk, I talk about the drug issue and drugs, and I talk about sexuality. 
okay? Uh, I talk about um, who are you? No, really, who are you? Okay, is it the $250 Nike shoes that epitomize who you are? Yeah. Or is it something else, something deeper, something more spiritual, something more wonderful? So this my straight talk book can be obtained at a couple of bookstores here in San Francisco, as well as hg-inc.org. So for those of you who haven't read it, I hope that you'll recommend it. It is for everyone to read. Everyone reads my book. Uh, it does mm -hmm. make a difference what color, what gender, what age. They read it and they give me feedback on it. And, and that's helpful to me. I am working on the second book now for girls and young women. That book has taken me a lot of time because I've got a lot to say to uh, my sisters. But I did want to say to all of you, we have been blessed to have conducted seven virtual presentations on systemic racism and white supremacy. We have covered uh, racism, uh, uh, understanding racism, law enforcement, housing, education, the war on drugs, gun violence, and systemic racism and violence against Asians. Seven presentations this year. I, I am so grateful to God that we were able to get this done because the intent was to have a, a, a forum, an opportunity to do what we must do if we're going to come to any kind of an agreement on how we can make things better in these areas. And we, that is that we need to communicate with one another and we need to start working together. I'm gonna tell you, I've read this to my team today. I'm gonna to read it to you. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And that's Margaret Mead speaking. And you know who Margaret Mead was and what she did. But it, it doesn't always take huge groups. It takes those of us who are committed working together to get things done. So, uh, I wanted to uh, let you know that what we discussed in, you know, in, in these forums has been issues of internalized racism that we unfortunately do to each other with, within our groups, uh, systemic racism, which pervades everything in many ways and has poisoned the American system. It has limited what America can be, a land of opportunity for all people. And uh, so as we close out this series of events for 2021, we are grateful to those of you who have attended our events and given us superb feedback. We appreciate you and we want you to know that. Uh, what will we be doing with these, these um, virtual presentations? We will be putting them into a book which can be disseminated to a group of individuals, hopefully educational institutions, uh, CBOs, public and private businesses, because if they won't allow the truth to be told in the schools and if they keep on fooling around with talking about critical race theory when it's not even being taught in our schools, and if they keep denying the history that everybody knows occurred in America so that we can get past some of that and move forward to do productive, wonderful things, then we must, as a committed small group of thoughtful people, change the world by telling the truth and making sure that information is available to all of our young people and our families. That's all of us, okay? We need to know more about the Chinese experience than, than just the Chinese Exclusion Act. I have a book that shows that way back in the day before the civil rights movement started, it was a Chinese family that fought against the racism in the deep South where they lived. But see, you don't hear that information. You don't hear about Jews and what they experienced. You don't hear about uh, African-Americans who have made success, been successful in the worst of times. I don't know about you, but that makes me stand up and say, I've got to do something through the grace of God, giving me the wisdom I need in order to be able to do that. Because so their lives will not have been lost in vain. So I'm saying to you, we look forward to presenting more systemic racism events in 2022, God willing, of course. And we will be 
in contact with you on the details. I am pleased to announce that our own Thor Kaslowski will be featured in one of those presentations. He will be talking about the Black Jew situation, which you never hear anything about. I've got some other people lined up, a wonderful woman, one of my PWIC sisters, who's gonna come in and talk about racism and feminism. Oh, 2022 is going to be great, but it's all based on God allowing us to do that and us doing the work that is needed, the work that will be revealed in the book that we will present <clears throat> that shows how you can make change personally and systemically, okay? So those are my closing thoughts. I want to thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you for participating in these public forums. Uh, if you have any ideas, if you have any uh, uh, resources that you'd like to share with us, with the Honeycutt Foundation and HG Inc. and with our team, please do. Thank Survey, you. It's in the God, chat. God bless you. you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Oh, there's something there. Doc, that, keep going, yeah. Dr. Hennecott. There's a survey in the chat. If Before you sign off, if you can all just click on it, take just one or two minutes and uh, provide us with your thoughts. Thank you. Dr. Hennecott, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, And thank you, Do uh, Commissioner Linda Richardson. She writes, congratulations on these wonderful and educational workshops and for your exceptional leadership in the community. You make us very proud and to your team, kudos. There's no one like Linda Fadiki Richardson. There's just no one like her. What an inspiration uh, she is to all of us. So my friends, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm waving goodbye to you. God bless you. And thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. I'd like to say, uh, let's try to be part of creating a symphony for humanity. Yes. Every West can every one of us can play a part in that symphony thank you amen you and there's our staff our team and we're we're here and uh glad to be together and uh thank you for my sister angela being on the call today <laughs> yes thank you angela you had great comments and mary you can stop the facebook streaming i think and good night everyone good thank night you, mary feel free to sign off thank, thank you, you. Thor. Thank you, Dr. Canton.